Good morning and welcome to another exciting edition of day four, number 118. We're climbing up there. What the man, Frank Scalist. Frank, how are things over in, is it the Buckeye State? It is the Buckeye State. I feel like that gives a like that gives a lot of credence to the Ohio State University it calling gives. it the Buckeye State. Why are they not calling it the Bobcat State? Well, we probably have more Buckeyes than Bobcats. You know, my dad is a <laughs> proud Ohio University alum. Well, there you go. The green and white, the Bobcats. That's good, but uh, but it, this it focuses around the Ohio State. Matt, I hear that's you. my alma mater. Oh, you went to the Ohio State? I did. I did not realize that. Yeah, you know, just some more. Have we had that talk yet? Were you we in have a, were you in a fraternity? I was for about a minute. You were in a fraternity at Ohio State. Yes, I was. My first my first year down there, I got closed out of housing. And um, I got an apartment off campus, which is unheard of for a freshman. I think I um, feel like you might have told set, told that story before. It's a possibility, but uh, know you anything. know, I did the I did the tournament. I mean, the tournament thing. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't for me. I did the I did the fraternity thing, and um, you know, they the the talk of hazing and everything else back in my day. Um, it was very close to the truth, but um, we got even with uh, the pledge master. I got you. Are you allowed to say what fraternity you're briefly a part of? I, know I am. That's I a am secret. I am not going to um, divulge that information, but let's okay. just say it was they lost their charter a few times. <laughs> okay, boy, I tell you what, you mentioned Ohio State and all the Michigan fans come out of the woodwork because they've been waiting for a decade. <laughs> 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 and so the the guy the pledge master guy that thought up of all the horrifying pranks to pull on us um we got him we i tackled him we um removed him of his garments and saran wrapped to him to a tree yeah no you can't say what fraternity you were in no no, no absolutely i think that the uh I got to be honest, Frank. I'm in a bit of a sour mood this morning. I sense that. What's the story? Okay. We, we always, well, I feel like you and I have the same routine coffee wise. You have your, I, this is a, this is a different one, but uh, we always have our coffee mugs. My BTO one's dirty this morning and there's coffee in them. And on Thursdays, uh, I have the ESPN plus app and I watch, uh, opening round coverage of whatever like it's the travelers i believe this week of the pga tour golf so i sit in my recliner and i have my coffee i might be the first person in history to spill coffee all over my back (laughs) what what did you go yay (laughs) no oh i was so bitter i had i was ready to go for day four i was looking good and I had the coffee mug. Well, I don't. My recliner doesn't have a, a, a cup holder on either side, right? Right. So on. I had it. I just had it like next to my next to my leg, and okay. I adjusted, and it tipped over and then rolled behind me, right where the mouth spigot was, all over my lower back, boxers, <laughs> and shorts. So here I I was half an hour before the show, just watching golf sipping on my coffee, having a great morning. And the next thing you know, soaked shirt, soaked pet on my back, the small of my back. I poured coffee down the back of my pants this morning. Oh, I was so angry. That's a, that's a hell of a feat. I, and I, I had to wash all my, all everything. So I just had to strip down, go completely new wardrobe for today's show. Well, yeah, you can't go, you can't come out here dripping with coffee, dude. Now I gotta I'm, be the first person to spill coffee on my back. I, you probably are. And now I'm surprised that you didn't burn the crap out of yourself. Cause me, I, I nuke my coffee and then pour it in my mug. So it's dude, it's like lava in there. So it'll stay warm for the mm-hmm. entire show. Cause I can't, I cannot drink cold coffee. I am not one of those guys that you're going to see in the summertime walking around with ice cubes in a coffee cup. 
Yeah, uh, is- guys were saying that uh, my lower back tattoo got dirty because of that. I actually, yeah, my lower back tattoo changes <laughs> based on temperature. It's a mood tattoo, folks. So outstanding. You know. I'm not going to go down <laughs> that Lord. road. We're not All going right. there. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, you cannot help but open social media now, and it happens every year, right around this time, the end of June, the beginning of July, kind of before, based on where you are. But it is 100 percent. Wide open, full swing, giant smallmouth bass time. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, it's happening. It, it's, it's this time of year because it's all up north. And so we're not as far ahead as you guys, obviously. A um, lot, lot of spawning going on. Um, they're fairly smallmouth. They're very easy to catch on the beds. They're not like largemouth where you got to annoy them and tease them and find that little sweet spot. Half the time when you pitch on a smallmouth on the bed, she's coming up to meet it before it even hits the bed. Mm -hmm. Um, now there are some finicky smallmouth. They do get, they do get times where they get finicky, but you can still catch them. Um, I very rarely had to leave a small mouth because I couldn't catch it. Uh, but large mouth, sometimes you can't, you got to leave them because you're spending too much time on one bass. And so you leave them. But uh, yeah, it's the small mouth, small mouth are, it's such an awesome fish. It, it is such an awesome fish. And I'm torn between small mouth and spotted bass being, my favorite. I have to say smallmouth is probably my legitimate favorite, but spotted bass are very close because a, we don't have a ton of them here. Um, so we don't, I don't get to fish for them all that much. So when I go down to Alabama and, and places that have spotted bass, like table rock and stuff, um, I, I get a kick out of that cause I love catching them. I think they're as crazy as smallmouth actually. I wonder if the smallmouth for the Southern guys, because it's like kind of the mystery of going up and catching the smallmouth. Yeah. But it seems like the Northern guys are just as obsessed with them as the Southern guys. Like it's a fish that no one ever gets tired of catching. No, it's like a, it's almost got a cult following. Um, I mean, it's they're first of all, they're beautiful bass. They fight like they have the will to live. When you hook them, they have the will to live. They're, they're not giving up on you. And, um, you know, in, in fact, I've been hooked more times by smallmouth than I have any other species except maybe a muskie. Um, like hooked, like you personally hook in the hand. Yeah. Because more body the, part. Right, because you get them, you think they you think they caved, you get them, and then they go ape shit when you take them out of the water and put them in the boat. And um, yeah, I mean it's just and then and and the funny thing is, you know what smallmouths the ones that get you are the little twelve inchers. Yeah, they get they get you every time because you can, there's no you you're trying you know you're trying to get them and they're not big. The big giant ones you got stuff to grab. So there's a roundabout. Uh, I thought this was interesting as I was getting ready for the show. Uh, I know we're going to talk a little bit uh, about small mouse. We're going to talk a little bit about trailer maintenance. We're going to take some questions from the listeners today. Kind of a hodgepodge show. And I have uh, I have questions too. I, I need answers. Okay. But there is kind of the distribution. And I did not realize how... I mean, right there. There it is. Like, you are one of the only... St- like seven or eight states where the whole thing is like where they're, I guess, native. Yeah. Yeah. Back in the old days, I did a, I did a study on this back in the old days. The reason that smallmouth are so widely spread is they used to put them, they used to take baby smallmouths in barrels filled with water, bunch of baby smallmouths on the railway. And then when the railroad would go to pass these, lakes rivers and streams etc they would dump them in Uh, Um, as the train was still moving well they would i i obviously stopped the train and dump them in but that's what they would do um they basically they stock smallmouth in places that they were not native to and 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 it's been so long now that you know they become part of that environment did you see where uh the New York state record was broken again now uh, with the same fish that weighed a pound heavier a year after he caught it. I believe it was out of Cayuga. 
No, what? How did they know it was the same bass? Because the same guy caught it, who caught the other record at the same time of year, in the same area, and the fish had the same markings on it, and it's built no exactly kidding. the same. It was like a nine pounder. Wow. Yeah, and not to say not anything about the ten pounder they caught on in uh, Lake Erie last year. Yeah. Let me see if I can find a picture of this for you. I I believe I saw the bass, but but pull it up anyway. I'm curious. Uh, in the meantime, have you had a chance to get out? Like, is everything rolling for you, or did you have? I know right before we went live, you said that you had some trailer issues. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been I've been getting out periodically. Um, I haven't really been chasing on the smallmouth. I've been uh, I've been chasing videos, and what I mean by that is I, I'll have a lure that I have to get a video on because when the bait arrives, it'll be timely. The video will be timely for that crankbait. The problem is, is that we're a little early for what I got to get videos on. So I've been trying to make something happen. That's not right yet. It's not perfect. So I've been chasing ghosts for a little while, which is um, frustrating me. Oh Whoa. yeah. Man alive. What a, sloppy fish that is yeah so the one on the left right here is the most recent one the one on the right is the record they're fishing the finger lakes open cayuga man that lake came on strong did it it yeah it never used to fish like that dude uh the bass was a giant and the anglers had to cull a five pounder to stay within the five fish limit. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Their five bass totaled 33 pounds. <sighs> and this fish was nine six. That's unbelievable. He said, I know it was the same bass because of the unique distinguishing markings, which we pointed out on the video. I released the bass last year, which was caught in 10 feet of water, about a half mile from where I caught her this year in two feet of water. Last year, it was 8.58 pounds. Wow. Nine wow. six, and he didn't want to stress it anymore, so they released her right after the weigh in. Man, there you go. What a beautiful animal. What is your PB? Seven one smallmouth. Have you told the story of how you caught that? Yeah, I caught a seven one and a six fifteen on back to back casts. Wow, yeah, it was spectacular, and I had a couple of fives to go with it. With um. I had a big limit that day, man. It was one derby of my or fun fishing. It was fun fishing. It was a it was a private derby amongst a couple of buddies. Okay. And man, were they they were so <laughs> I, I'm telling you, dude, they were so freaked out when I came in. I made them all take their fish out first. <laughs> and they had solid fish, you know what I mean? They had solid fish. We I was actually doing a thing for my sponsor, OSI sealants and adhesives. And uh I had two guys and my buddy had two guys and we were doing a we were doing a best fish contest. And um I probably told the story, so I'll I'll shorten it way up. My guys wanted a fish for largemouth, and I said we can't win on largemouth. But if you want to fish for largemouth, I don't really care because there's nothing on the line. It's about it's about you guys. So we went largemouth fishing for about two or three hours in the morning, and we had about 18 pounds worth of largemouth. And I'm like, we got to go because <laughs> this ain't going to work. And so we went out on the lake, and I had been idling around out there, and I said, this looks right. There's fish on it. Let's fish it. And so the dude catches one about four pounds and he's all jacked up. It's the biggest smallmouth he ever caught in his life. So I'm like, well, it's our biggest bass. Let's throw it in the live well. And then if we catch bigger ones, we'll just pitch it. And he's like, dude, that's the biggest bass of my life. I'm like, yeah, but you'll catch bigger ones. You know what I mean? So right after that, I catch one over five. So I don't, don't even think twice. I just... I unhook mine, throw him in the live well, throw the four pounder out. And the guy is like, dude, what are you doing? This is my you know, personal best, man. 
right and i'm like oh my god i'm sorry you know because we never even took a picture of it so the long and short of it is um we catch some good ones i i i slide off the structure and i see fish on a tube yeah i I see i was cracking a tube i see fish off the structure you know what i mean like not on it Mm -hmm. so i said oh those those are going to be big ones man and um I rifle a cast out there and I go, and it gets it, you know, and I'm like, oh my God. And I'm fighting them in and I go, I think it's a big sheephead. Oh my God, this fish. And so then all of a sudden, dude, it, it starts to come up. You know how you see your line coming up? I go, oh, if this is a small mouth, this is a giant. And, and he gets, she gets her face out of the water and she just go, can't get her big belly over. You know what I mean? And I'm like, oh my God. So I get the fish to the side of the boat. I scoop her up and it's a giant and I throw it in the live well. And, um, the guy goes, do you want to throw the other one out? And I go, no. And he goes, why not? I go, because I know the dude we're fishing against, he's going to bring in five. So let's just bring in our five best. Well, I make another cast out there, stroke, stroke, wham, I get another one. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's just as big as the first one. So I throw her in the live well. Well, one of my guys catches a good one. We throw it in the live well. Anyway, the long and short of it is our smallest bass was a heavy four pounder. And we had that we had the limit anchored with a six fifteen and a seven one. And so when we came in, I told my guys, I said, no matter what these guys do, we're gonna I'm gonna make them pull their fish out first. And I promise you they're bringing five because I know the dude and he's not bringing in one bass. So no matter what they do when they pull their fish out, I want you guys to act like they're the biggest smallmouth you've ever seen in your life. So they're like, okay, we're in. So we go <laughs> we go there and I make them pull their fish out first they pull out like a like a three and a half and my guys are like oh man you know and and they let it go they pull out another one about the same size and they're like oh man you know and they do this for all five fish and they're all cookie cutters so maybe one might have been you know three and three quarters their best one would have been about three and three quarters almost four pounds and so they go, okay, Scalish, it's your turn. So I go, okay. So I, I fumble around in the live well looking for the smallest bass. And I pull it out, and they're all like, oh, my God, you know, because it's like it's just under five pounds. And I go, oh, wait a minute. Oh, that's the wrong one. And I slide it over the side of the boat. <laughs> I go in, and I gradually go bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, I get to the last two. And I go here. I'll just pull. I'll just pull this one. I got both my arms in the live well. I'm trying to get them both. And mm-hmm. I get them both. And I take them out of the live well, dude. They like never stop coming out of the live well. You know how they are. They're so yeah. big. I pull them out, and they're just like, oh my god. They, dude, they were freaking out, freaking out. So the dude snaps a picture of me holding these two, okay. And I and he sends it to me, and I save it on my computer. Now this was a while ago, obviously, because I was still fishing Bassmasters. Mm-hmm. Save it on my computer. I got a virus in that old computer, and it ate everything in my computer up. No, and I, and I don't have the photo anymore. No way. Yeah, the, my two biggest smallmouth back to back, and I don't have ever the picture, ever, and I don't six have fifteen the seven one. Yeah. Now this year, this year I caught one. That was a heavy six, but I didn't, I didn't have a scale with me to weigh it. Mm-hmm. It, I, it wasn't seven pounds. I can promise you that, but it was a heavy six <sighs> and, um, yeah, it was crazy. I caught it on an, uh, an excess crankbait. I would love to know the percentage of what I would like. You're a hardcore smallmouth angler. What the percentage of smallmouth anglers have, have boated a seven pounder. Um, I mean, is that if you do it long enough, you think you're going to catch one? Or there are guys who smallmouth fish their whole lives in good areas where they live and don't catch a seven. Yeah, I mean, seven. When you start getting smallmouth in that seven pound range, you're 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 looking at um, special fish. Um, it takes 15 years for a Lake Erie smallmouth to get five pounds. 
they did scale studies studies so you're like uh you're either dealing with a gland issue or a a fish that's 20 years old legal drinking age fish right you're 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 dealing with an old animal or one that um has that special gene in them you know where they get Mm -hmm. where, where they can get really big i gotta i gotta shut my phone off it's beeping on me no it's all good David said that he thinks maybe only 3% of anglers, the smallmouth anglers, Frankie Jr. never caught it. Sean, he wants a freak smallie. Now, I remember the first six-pound smallie that I caught was in 2021. They don't look real. It, they're a different specimen when yeah. it came, came up. Because I caught three over six out of the St. Lawrence in... 11 days one on a day of practice one screwing around with travis manson while we were perch fishing and one on my last cast of the second day of the tournament yeah and they dude, progressively yeah. went bigger it went like six one six twenty two six six yeah those are big fish um you know you got to realize something like some of the fish that they were catching on cayuga this year surprised me uh, Why because is that? well back in the day um when I was still doing Bass Masters, Cayuga, you could catch a ton of fish, but mm-hmm. you just didn't get that kind of quality out of it. Um, and now it seems like it's turned into a, a very high quality fishery. Now, that being said, they are fishing around the spawn. So mm-hmm. all those big females are now within range. And so if if a lot of those big females, because a lot of big females on Lake Erie will chase pelagics all year, and you only come in contact with them periodically, springtime very much so, and then fall when they come back to the shallow structure again. Um so so I think you know I I it's that's it's just hard to keep it's hard to catch giant ones consistently like that Mm -hmm. um except during the springtime because there's so many of them in confined areas i think your chances are better now those fish that i caught um that was not that was the end of summer um actually if i'm not so those are seven and a half eight pounders during the spawn oh yeah oh yeah they're big dude let me ask you this then as we're as we're kind of gearing up for the smallmouth openers for a bunch of states up north, and I think the Canada and it's kind of opening weekends and a bunch of stuff around here where guys can target smallmouth now. Uh, largemouth, it's real easy to say you're targeting trophy largemouth. You tie on a glide bait, fourteen inch worm. There's yeah. all sorts of baits that you're predicated. You're, yeah, yeah, your likelihood of hooking a ten pounder goes through the roof as long as you're on a fishery smallmouth i don't feel like it's like that like you're using the same baits to catch the two pounders that you are the seven or eight pounders is there any way to up your odds bait wise if you're wanting to target that five pound plus smallmouth yeah and here's the here's the issue okay um i throw big baits for smallmouth i always have um i i want to I want to try to eliminate a smaller part of the food chain. So I always try to upsize. But the truth of the matter is there are times when smallmouth want smaller stuff. And so you have to get finesse. I don't necessarily mean finesse with the technique, but finesse with the size mm-hmm. of the tube or whatever you're throwing. Um, I, there was, I could, I could give you both scenarios um, in one tournament. Um, I was catching them on a little three inch yum dinger and they, that's all they would eat. I so put the four head. inch. Yeah. I put the four inch on and nothing. And, and, and so I had to, I had to downsize. And then there was a time when it was a four or a five inch dinger and they wouldn't touch anything smaller. I do the same thing with tubes. I've got tubes that are, you know, almost five inches long and tubes that are an inch and a three quarters. You know what I mean? Because you don't know. Um, drop shotting is the same way. You could be drop shotting a little tiny finesse bait, or you could be drop shotting a full size, um, you know, super fluke or breaking shad. Um, it just depends. I mean, their attitude, uh, where with, I noticed with large mouth that, you know, traditionally, if you want to target a bigger large mouth, just throw a bigger bait. 
Um, but there are times when, you know, bass are feeding on certain size bait fish and you, and you have to replicate that. But smallmouth are crazy because there's no rhyme or reason. Like I crankbait, I crankbait a lot of smallmouth. Now mm -hmm. my biggest two, obviously they came on a tube. They didn't come on a crankbait. Um, but I, I crank for a small mouth and I, you can jump up size class by throwing big crankbaits like a DD 22 or a Norman NXS, you could jump up size class, but here's the thing. Okay. If you're not around big ones, you're not going to catch big ones. Um, mm -hmm. I've caught tons of two pounders and three pounders on crankbaits um, because I wasn't near any big ones. But as soon as you get near a big one, you jump up to the food chain. Um, and so that's a that's a, a lot of the issue with smallmouth. And what you'll notice on the Great Lakes, they school by size class. Inland lakes, not so much. Um, for whatever the reason, if if you're on if you're on the Great Lakes and you're catching two and a half three pounders, that's you're what you're on. Two and a half. Yep, I've noticed that on yeah. Ontario. Yeah, hundred percent. And and like so, what I used to hear a lot is um, guys would go out and go, "Man, I caught I caught sixty fish today, and I had one over four pounds. I know I can get twenty pounds a day." I'm like, "No, you can't." And they're like, "What are you talking about?" I said, you, you got to go through 120 fish to catch two, four pounders at your, at your rate. <laughs> if you're catching 60 to catch one, you got to go 120 to catch two and you're not going to catch 400 bass in one day. So you can't get 20 pounds. Um, you know what I mean? They don't, they don't understand that mentality. And right. they say, well, how many did you catch? I said, I only caught 12 but everyone's over four pounds and you can only weigh in five. So what's, you know what I mean? So, so you have to change your mentality on the smallmouth game. You got to fish to win only to win because you can catch a lot of smallmouth if you're in the right places, mm -hmm. but you can't catch a lot of big ones unless you're on big ones. Oh, so that's not only for tournaments, but there's a lot of guys that are watching today shot and stuff like, dude, I want to catch slob smallmouth. So if you're going out, you have to know yeah it's it might not be the funnest 7 hours of the day because right. you're you're saying i know we can catch two and a half and three pounders which if you're not from smallmouth country that's freaking fun oh dude it's a ball but boss. you have to you have to continually keep looking right. so the key isn't is what what i'm hearing you say the key if you're looking for those big slobs like you like to call isn't necessarily which it can be but it's not bait predicated as much as it is area predicated location. and location, location predication. Yeah. predication. It's location. Uh, and that's the thing. And, 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 and that's the thing. If you're, if you're, if you're catching small mouth, let's just say three and a half pounds or less. It's so hard to leave that. Mm -hmm. Okay. It is so hard as an angler to leave but on all the smallmouth fisheries that i fished through my whole bass master career if i was catching two and a half and three pounders i was gone i didn't even stay on them and wail on them i mm -hmm. was gone because i knew that you can't you cannot win you cannot win and so i would keep looking and keep looking and keep looking um the irony of the whole thing is everybody assumes because i live on lake erie i fish lake erie all the time the truth couldn't be it couldn't be farther from the truth i barely fish the lake um the problem is i would put my time in for the tournaments that we had up there and i would and i would spend literally days idling around looking for stuff and we covered a lot of that in yep. past things how to find you, it what you're looking right. for how to be productive on the water without 100%. actually making a cast and so what would happen is i as soon as i would drop down if i if i if i caught a three and a half i i fished it a little bit to see it because because fours and three and a halves and three fifteens they'll hang out together but if I don't catch fish over four, 
I have to leave it and go look for other fish. So I may pull up on a rock pile, drop down a couple times, catch three fish. None of them are over four pounds or close to four. I'll label it as a C plus spot and I'll move on. Or I'll label it the weight of the fish. Back in the day, I used to label it the weight between, you know, two and three quarters to on two your and graph. three and a halves on my graph. Okay. So when I zoom out at a glance, I can say, oh, there, there were some, you know, three and a half pounders over there. I'm going to run by it. We're going to make a few throws because you might catch that errant five pounder or four pounder. Okay. So, but I don't rely on those spots unless I need a fish. And if I need a fish, I'm not winning it. Um, you know, that's just how it goes um, with small mouth. You know, in Buffalo, when I won Buffalo the last day of the tournament, I was throwing, I threw back two limits of fish. I didn't even put them in my boat because they were small. And my non-boater freaked me out. And so I threw a limit in the boat and it almost cost me the win because the next spot I moved to, I got on the sloppy ones again. And I called out, but I had a dead one, a small dead one from, you know, mm -hmm. from the thing. So it takes it, catching true trophy smallmouth um and multiple times during the seasons not just in the spring cuz right. the spring is the easiest so we'll say throughout the seasons mm -hmm. we're getting into midsummer right now right Re summer. Re requires more work than i have ever put in largemouth fishing that's what I've got right here. Let's do the recipe because you've we've talked about all this, but let's put it together because I think there's a lot of people that are are interested in this. Let's pull together some bullet points. Are you good with that? Because we've been yeah. talking about it all, but recipe for true giants. Yeah, you see, you see my notes for today's show. Yeah, well, I've got <laughs> it right here. I got it right here. So yeah, so Th there might be a little, there might be a little bit of uh of self-interest in this topic seeing as i will be on the st lawrence river in uh in a month well that's cool I'm, so, I'm actually jealous i i i need to go out and start i need to go out and start focusing back on these fish up here because um i don't want to say this it's going to sound really arrogant probably but i'm i'm bored to death fishing inland lakes anymore um I really am. I, I, um, I like fishing new bodies of water and I've put my boat in a, just about every damn body of water within three hours of my house. And I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of need to go get back out on the giant lake and, um, dissect certain sections of it. I started a little bit, um, several weeks ago and I picked areas of the lake that are not known for quality smallmouth and stuff like that and and not numbers and there's mm -hmm. reasons for that the, to the topography doesn't present itself for massive amounts of uh, spawning activity and and you know it's too steep too fast kind of stuff but um there are smallmouth there it takes a lot of work i spent two days um you know, to catch a half a dozen, but I, I didn't put one in the boat that was under four pounds. Mm -hmm. So, so it was worth it. Um, but I, that's not tournament, that's not tournament grade mm -hmm. fishing right there. That's just me doing something personal. Um, but yeah, so go ahead. What your questions are. Oh, just a recipe. I just wanted to do a okay. quick bullet point that just kind of recapped what we talked about today, pulled in some of the stuff from the other shows. So, you okay. know, going into the summer, I mean, number one is obviously location. You got to be on right. a fishery where big ones live. That's a hundred percent number now. One. And, and the here. Okay. So, all right. The first bullet point is what are you fishing? And when I say, what are you fishing? Is it a grass lake? Um, a lot of the Northern glacier lakes are grass. They do have a lot of grass in them. So, so you have to break it down. Is it a grass lake? Is it a great lake like Erie, Ontario, Superior, et cetera? Superior. One of, you're right. One of the great lakes. Michigan. Um, right. And so you, so that's the first thing I look at. Mm -hmm. Is it a river system? So, th so now you've got three things you're looking at. All right. Um, each one is different. Each one plays differently. 
okay and there will be some crossover in estuary type fisheries like st lawrence for example okay because you could stay in the river proper current becomes your best friend um or you can gravitate to the main lake and then it starts to fish like a great lake again yep but you also have to it's realize it is right it is so you also have to realize this too um how shallow will the fish be when you get there because if you're if you're if the fish don't need to be deep to get everything they need they won't be there will be some deep there always is some smallmouth deep on the Great Lakes. I don't care what anybody says. There always is deep fish on the Great Lakes. Okay. But if you put yourself in a position to look for a needle in the haystack, you've got a lot of work ahead of you. So you want to try to be where the most of your bass are at whatever time of year you're fishing. So you always fish the percentage. All right, the 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 non percentage can pay dividends, but it could take you weeks to. You find can also that. strike out. Correct. And if you got a week to do it. Right. Exactly. I mean, you know, if you've got two days of fishing or three days of fishing, you're taking a little vacation. <laughs> Chris um, says the big water is therapeutic, or it can send you to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, there is no, that nothing truer has been stated on this show than that right there. Oh, that, that is, made the morning. Man, that's literally what you just said in one sentence. Yeah, that's okay. so good. That is so perfect. So we've kind of narr narrowed that, that down. Yeah. And then, and then, and then, so, you know, the main thing that I want to know, if I'm going to any smallmouth fishery, I don't care. I, I don't care what you're catching them on. I don't care how you're catching them. All I care about is how deep are you getting bit. Okay. Because if I have a depth range in mine, I can broaden it by five feet one side, five feet the other side. So I can broaden that depth range by 10 feet. And I know that I'm in the high percentage depth range. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the real key. Um, <laughs> that's the <laughs> all kinds of thing. Doesn't matter. Physical therapy, mental therapy. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so, and so that's the big key with small mouth is what depth uh, range. Listen, I know you're, uh, you're a Powell guy. I don't know if you have a real sponsor. Everyone uses different reels, but, no, but I don't for me, for me, I have also noticed, especially after having Tang. And like I said, I'm not a big expert on this stuff on the big smallies, but when you hook one, I have found you will be glad if you have, the right rod a reel with good drag, drag. system on it like i don't really i don't I, think you want to skimp on that like i mean if you're gonna go target yeah. five to seven pounders a you're probably spending a little bit of money because you're away from your house spend that extra money to get the right equipment to land that fish when it when it the time comes there's no question about it there's no question now the thing because i'm old school mm -hmm. back in the day our reels had terrible our special our, yeah we back reeled um i do the same thing today um i don't my drag is an emergency brake system where if i'm back reeling on a fish and something catastrophically goes wrong <laughs> that my my drag will compensate for my ignorance basically um so i set my drag that it that it will will go out without breaking the line and maintain pressure on that fish and and then it's just an emergency i you'll never see me fight a big small mouth and watch my spinning reel go because i'm back reeling them the whole time wow see I, you're i think you're one of the few that are left that are one you're one of the few remaining back reelers frank because i was a back reeler i was a back reeler up until about five years ago yeah, and see, and I'll tell you something else I do when I'm cranking big smallmouth. The minute I got a giant one in, I hit my thumb bar and I use my thumb to control mm -hmm. how much line I'm giving that fish when he runs to run. Because then I can control the amount of pressure on him. And then again, my drag is just set there in case something bad goes on. I don't break the fish off or I don't lose the fish. Mm -hmm. What What was the back reeling comment? Uh, just, uh, he's, I would totally mess that up. I think there's a lot of guys, there's some reels that don't even have the back reeling option now. 
Yeah, which I I won't be buying. Brett says I'm too young to know how to back reel. You're never too young to experiment. <laughs> uh, before we wrap up this segment about kind of giant smallies, I think that that we'd be remiss if we didn't have kind of a little bit of a conservation segment as to h- how you handle uh, a big yeah. fish, some keys to making sure that that fish survives another five years of its life uh, when you do catch it. So you don't end up with one that is now light tan with red eyes and belly up in the live well an hour after you've caught this thing. Yeah. So the first thing I will say is that I don't fun fish for smallmouth deep. I won't do it. Um, I, I can, I can, my dad, a boy, Michael. <laughs> and Simonton's he, caught a few. That's who I'm going on the perch, the perch fishing trip the end of the month with. That's outstanding. With my dad, the that 25th dude. and the 26th out of Erie. Jumbo, yeah, that dude, Jumbo that dude, perch. That dude knows how to back reel. He's not, he's not uh, unfamiliar with smallmouth, but, um, um, what the hell conservation we're talking oh, yeah, about the big fish what to do okay. if you do land one of these things okay so f- the first thing is is i don't fish for for them for fun when they when they get deeper than 25 28 feet i won't do it um i read a delayed mortality report and um it's dang near 40 percent when the water temperature is over 70 degrees and you're catching oh, wow. them and you're catching them deep Keep going. I'll um, be back. I'm going to go grab some real quick. That's okay. So, so I don't do that. Um, I have this thing where it's going to take that fish 15 years to get to a size class that makes him very special or her very special. Um, knowing that I'm going to go out and let's just say kill 20% of everything I catch for fun. Uh, that's not in my wheelhouse. I can't, I can't do that. Um, now I will confess, uh, Buffalo, I was catching them deep, uh, 38 to 42. Um, and that was, you know, I was fishing for the classic and 50,000 bucks and the elites. So, um, I had to, so I, I figure it like this, if I injured 10 fish that day, um, I didn't have a choice. I don't kill them. I don't keep them. If I did keep fish, uh, 10 wouldn't be uh, a terrible, you know, number. Um, and that's just justification in my own head because it bothers me to this day. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'll be honest with you. I did a show with Shaw Grigsby and, um, we were smallmouth fishing and uh, out of, uh, well, it was on the Erie, New York border. We were smallmouth fishing out there, and um, I found a pretty good pot of fish, very deep. Well, not very deep, probably right around 28 to 30, and we were catching some big ones, and I noticed a couple floating, so we gathered them up. We fizzed them all, um, let them go. They swam away like they're supposed to swim away. Um, and then I caught one that was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was just under six pounds. It was like 515. And um, I had a photo shoot to do the next day. So I kept three, four pounders. Um, and that big one was having trouble. Uh, we tried to fizz it. We tried to let it go. It kept floating up. So I kept the big one in my live well, put the chemicals in there, um, got her settled down overnight. She was good. She, I woke up in the morning, all the, all the, the, th- the four fish I had in my live well were all perfect. When I lifted up the lid, they went mental. Everything was good. So I met the writer at the ramp. And the first thing I did was I idled out and let the, let the big one go. Mm-hmm. And he's like, was pissed. He's like, I want pictures of that. And I go, we're not, we're not doing that with this fish. I got other ones we could do pictures with. This fish is going free, so I let her go. So we did the we did the pictures with the other ones, and I'm like this: one photo, the fish goes back, we and he's like, "Shots," and he's like, "No, we're doing another." And I said, "We're not, we're not using this fish multiple times." 
It's not going back in the live well. It's going back in the lake. We're letting it go. And so the, the writer actually got a little irritated with me. So what wound up happening was I, we had the other fish to use and I, they slipped out of my hand and went in the lake. You know what I mean? I um, because I wasn't going to put the fish through that. Well, we were, we were coming back in because all I did was go out there to take some pictures and then come right back in. We were coming back in and I noticed something bobbing in the water. I idled over to it. It was that big smallmouth. Uh. So I, I picked her up, put her back in the live well, worked with her, worked with her. She got okay. I let her go again. I waited and waited. She bopped back up. I took her back in and um, I, I wound up mounting it because it, it had died. And um, I was sick about it. And the and the, the writer I was with said, just just leave it in the lake. I'm not going back to get that fish. Just leave it there. The birds will eat it. And I said, dude, I'm not doing that. And I never did another article with that particular writer either. Interesting. This is that's the, that's what I went to get, Frank. Outstanding. So I, I got. I got that the last time I was in uh, New York for the Bassmaster Opens. You could have that. So this is a needle. That's just the case. So then there's the needle. And you have to right. leave the pin in. Yeah. Right. So all this is, this is really cool. This is a pin that comes out and, and there's your needle. And then when this goes in here, it, it augers out or it cleans out that hole so that you always have air airflow when you put it in the fish and then you pull it you know you've got it directly into the swim bladder right and then they taught us how to uh how to use that fizz needle how to go back how to go into the fish for the first time how not to over fizz it and by the end you know i was catching fish in 35 foot and i couldn't even get a hold of them by the time i brought them back in and they kept their tiger stripes and they stayed dark and they were down at the bottom of the live well I mean, I had no issues with it. I've I've kept this specifically in the boat, and now I'm getting ready, you know, because I leave to go up north. Did it? Used it at Oneida. Stays like that. Stays right in the boat. Yeah, you have to. You have to fizz them, and and a lot of times, even the fizzing part doesn't work very well. Um, the delayed mortality is just incredible, and water temperature. What I found in the report I read, actually, I think Frankie sent it to me. Um, it was very extensive in the and the report the water temperature was critical especially running them around all day in your boat in the live well mm -hmm. um, was the, the more they're sitting in the live well and the more you're traveling over bumpy water um the more stress they get and the less chance they have to survive um so i don't even monkey with them when they're like that in the summer um not because of you can't catch them um, just because to catch some big ones, take a couple pictures and let them go and have them die. I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure that's the right attitude. I can't tell if people are joking on this. Mike was saying, is there any data from fish getting a disease from an unsterilized fizz needle, which I thought was a joke, <laughs> which I thought was a joke. But then Jay said that he keeps his fizz needles in 90% alcohol in storage to keep them clean. So now I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, it's like anything, dude. If it's if it's if it's filthy and you're sticking it in flesh, I'm sure there's bacterial issues. But, um, you know, I Man, mean, that could be true. And you just never, keep truer words have never been spoken, Uncle Frank. <laughs> Correct. You just you know just keep it clean. <laughs> I guess an infection would be a better word. Yeah, you don't want to give him an infection. Right, he said he right. wasn't joking. It was a serious question. Um, better safe than sorry. It can't hurt, right? I mean, yep. it can't hurt. You know, I mean, we're Jay's just not joking either. You just don't. What you don't want to do is destroy the fishery you love the most. Yep, and that's what I'm saying. You catch this thing, it's career. You're obviously going to want to take some pictures. Part of it's knowing that that thing is is down there again. You can get a replica made of it. Right. And, the, and thank God for the replicas. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But I only have two. I only have two fish mounted and both of them died. Um, I have um, a crappie that's almost two and three quarter pounds uh, mounted. 
and I I brought them in. I caught them. I actually caught more than one, but that was the best of the ones I caught. I brought them in. I weighed them. I had a state record for about an hour and a half. And um, the guy went to weigh it and he put it on his scale was on a file cabinet. He put it in the scale. It flopped, fell off the scale onto the ground. Um, and and so I put him back in the live well real quick. And I and I had a 125 gallon aquarium at home. So I brought him home, brought her home, put her in the aquarium um, to get her revived. And then I was going to let her go again. And um, she wound up dying overnight in the aquarium. And so I mounted that one. And then um, obviously my small mouth with Shaw I had mounted mm. um, because it died. And I just I couldn't waste it. You know what I mean? It would re- it really bummed me out, actually. Um Obviously, I'm still talking about the stupid thing. <laughs> All right. Uh, what else we got today, Frank? Uh, I know we'll be live well, next week. Uh, we're going to have a couple recorded shows in July. But uh, as we. Oh, you know what? June. What? I have something to say. Remember um, several episodes ago we did. I mentioned that thing uh, for the little girl that had. Um, yeah. Cancer. Yep. Uh, hook them for Haley. Yeah. Uh, Michelle and Troy called me the other day and um, she's got all her treatments, all her surgeries are done and she is 100% cancer free. So any, anybody that participated in that, thank you so much because um, literally you saved this little girl's life. Best way I can say it. Phenomenal. Blake is saying we need to do a live on the water tutorial. That may happen on the 23rd. It depends on my schedule, how the St. Lawrence goes, and Frank's schedule. July yeah, 23rd, it, there's a chance we may be live from the it, water. We'll just, we're going to have to see how that goes. There's a lot of things that have to line up for that, but we're going to try. If to we're not live, I, I got, I'd love to get out on the water with you that, on the 23rd, depending, depending well, that, on schedules. Let's, we'll just see what happens. We'll have opportunities. We're going to have opportunities to fish more. Matt. some opportunities i like it you also have the opportunity you're gonna love this one to get some of the new colors that are on lure net because we haven't really talked much about the paint shop lately and there nah. are there are several top water options uh thank you for everybody who's been posting we i've got seen probably at least a dozen color number seven spooks attached to feisty largemouth and smallmouth yeah i have two i love it i think it's fabulous so if you have caught uh, what i would like to do is to put a a a collage together so if you have caught a fish on the number seven spook send us a picture ideally with the spook still attached to the bass and not your hand (laughs) yeah anyway uh two new colors in the paint shop that just went live in the super spook junior crazy gill and reactor yeah and i dude i love the junior man Mm -hmm. i i I love the junior now this crazy gill is to me very close to oaky shad it's very close to oaky shad um it's a little it's it it's not as transparent as oaky shad oaky shad is uh, almost completely transparent um, that one is not. Okay. So it's more of a bone white color. It's it's more of a white pearl with a little bit of a pink pearl behind the stripes. And the stripes are silver metallic. It's it's a it's a good looking bait. Okay. And then uh reactor is the other yeah. one. That's kind of a blue backy herring color. Yeah, it is, and it's and it's um semi transparent. So it's good on those super clear water lakes. All right, there you go. What else you got? Well, the BTL 100 code is good till June 30th, and we, so we're we're running out of that. I got a bunch of new videos that are going to bust on LureNet YouTube. Um, some are out, some are coming out. Um, you know, I had you had mentioned earlier. Uh, about the trailer, the boat trailer. So yeah, um, so, I didn't want I didn't want us to start off just by, no. So with so anger here, and hate. It's not anger and hate. It's just it's just what happens. So um, 
I, I got the actuator, the whole entire piece, um, because mine was gone. Mine was shot completely, completely not working. So Frankie came over, and that literally is a ten minute job. Couple of couple of C clamps, put it in, put it together, bleed the system, you know the brake fluid, bleed the system, and you're done. You're 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 done. So we were we put the new one in and we were putting the brake fluid in there and I was bleeding, you know, Frankie's in the back with the bleeder valves. I'm up front pumping that thing. And I'm like, it's taking a lot of brake fluid. And then all of a sudden we see brake fluid just leaking out from all parts of my trailer. It's not good. Uh, no. So what happened was all the brake lines, they run them through the tube on a tube trailer, run them through the tube. The brake line was completely corroded. And and actually, once we had to take everything out, it was in multiple pieces. Um, so what turned out to be a 10 minute project literally took us like, you know, all 10 hours. Um, we were running back and forth to the parts store. Uh, looking for flex line not not the rubbery kind but um frankie's gonna kill me because he only told me what it's called 550 times but it's like uh copper alloy flex tubing it just bends real easy um and we tried to fish that through the trailer and all, the old brake lines were all in there cor you know corroded and piled mm -hmm. up and we couldn't anyway it was a it was a process. So we finally get the thing done. We get the brakes bled. We all, all yeah, easy bend. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> easy bend. So we get the thing done. The you know, the calipers are working, everything is good. We're good to go. Frankie goes, Hey, by the way, your back tire looks a little low. You probably want to check that out. And I'm like, Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll do it in the morning. I'm gonna go fish and you know, well, I get up in the morning and it's totally flat. Oh, and naturally. Yeah. So I, I jack it up. I look, I see that there's a screw in it, <laughs> pull the screw out, plug the hole, fill it up with air. And, um, and yeah, now it's good to go. And it's amazing how when everything works on your trailer and you actually put your brakes on to stop, there's no banging and clunking and you're not to the floorboard on your truck brakes, you know, trying to stop. It's just, it's amazing when stuff works, right? <laughs> oh but, man. But I got to give my hats off. To, I got to give my hat off to my kid because, um, he does a lot of the mechanical stuff, you know, for me. Um, and he is, um, he loses patience with me because, um, I'm like the guy that doesn't know what he's doing. That's in the way. When you that's could me do too. It, you could do it yourself in 20 minutes, but when I'm around, it takes 40, that kind of thing, you know. That's me too. I know there's something I'm forgetting. Um you know what'll make you remind you of it? I promise you'll be reminded of it as soon yeah, as, you as soon hear as this. we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it means you got about 30 seconds to remember it, Uncle Frank. Uh... If yeah. not, we're going to have to wait until the next live show, which will be next week, June 29th. <laughs> Nothing ringing a bell? Nothing. Let's close this bad Small boy. Small mouth, trailers, yeah. people cutting you off. I'm just throwing stuff out that might ring uh, a bell. Yeah, no, that happened uh, the last two times. Motor I was issues? Out, no, no motor issues. Don't go there. The motor's been absolutely Sales? fine. New products, colors? Oh, I got tons Releases? of colors. I have tons of colors coming out. I've been painting like a wild man, so there's going to be a lot of exciting things coming on LureNet very shortly. None of that rung a bell on what you're forgetting? No. We're going to just close It's not this an one. anniversary, birthday, nothing that you bet? No, it better not be, or I'm in hot water. Which means you don't want to be fishing for smallmouth in that water. No, As we not, learned today. Not, deep, not deep ones. <laughs> the deep ones. But uh, great show today. Uh, I guess if we're going to label it, it would be a uh, it'd be a trophy smallmouth episode. Sort of, yeah. I like that. It was. Well, we have to put a label on each one of these so you can do it. So uh, Let's call That's it what we're going to label it. We're going to label it the trophy smallmouth episode. All right. This has been 
Another edition of Day 4 with the man Frank Scalish. Day 4 number 118 is in the books. We'll see everybody next week. See ya.